Good day. It's so uh, good to be here with you. And again, for, for the, who knows how many times I've said this, thank you so much for inviting me into your places. Hope you've had a blessed week. I hope you've been able to uh, enjoy, uh, if you're in this part of uh, North America here in Alberta, enjoy some of the nicer weather that we've been having. And wherever you are, I pray that uh, you've had time to uh, read your Bible and pray and uh, join others in fellowship uh, and worship the Lord together. I just want to be, uh, begin by just uh, telling a story. It's um, a story that was uh, not of my origin by, by a person by the name of Dr. Larry Beaton. And it was during World War II, a military unit in the Pacific hired a local boy to cook and clean for them. And being a bunch of jokesters, uh, they quickly took advantage of the boy's seemingly inno innocence. They smeared Vaseline, for example, on the stove handles so it wouldn't get over his hands. They put buckets of water on the door, over the door, so he'd get soaked when he opened it. They even nailed his shoes to the floor during the night. And day after day, this uh, young boy took the brunt of their practical jokes without saying anything. Finally, the men felt guilty about what they were doing, so they met with him and said this, Look, we know these pranks aren't funny for you, and we're sorry. We're never going to take advantage of you again. And the boy, he simply smiled and asked, So, no more sticky on stove? And they replied, Nope. No more water on door? And they answered, No more water on door. No more nail shoes to floor? Nope, we'll stop that too. Okay, the boy said with a wide grin. Then, no more spit in soup. The Apostle Paul said to the Galatians, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Please turn in your Bibles to Galatians uh, chapter 6. We're going to pick up, pick up where we left off last week, but uh, for context, we're going to read together the first 10 verses of Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression... You who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For any, if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let, let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone, and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. Verse 6. Let the one who's taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from the flesh, well, from the flesh, pardon me, reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap, well, from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap, if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Our Lord, our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time together. We ask your blessing on it, and we ask, uh, Lord, that you would not only help us understand in our minds, but also move it into our hearts so it becomes a whole unit and then could we move with our hands and our feet into our homes and communities with the love of God through Christ we pray in Jesus name amen our focus today uh, will be from verse 6 to 10 and as we go along we should keep in mind that these five verses are not to be taken in isolation we don't we don't want to rip them out of, of the context. Because when we study the Bible, the, the very first rule of interpretation is our guide, and that is context, context, context. So when we look at these five verses, in a way we can reverse engineer our text. For example, verse 6 to 10 are part and parcel of Paul's commentary from verse 1 to 10. And verse 1 to 10 are part and parcel of Paul's closing statements here in the sixth chapter. <clears throat> 
And chapter 6 is to be understood in the view of all that Paul has said from the very first verse of his letter to the Galatians. And to put this in practical terms, today we will be dealing with the universal law of sowing and reaping, uh, clearly described here for us at verse 7 and 8. And whatever we might not end up saying in regards to this universal law, it will be in light, in the light of all that Paul had said before, verse 7 and 8. And you might ask why. Why all the care and attention to the context? Well, really, it's to protect you and me from misunderstanding and, mis and misapplying the principles and commands of God that we find in his holy word, the Bible. And in this case... It's the universal principle of sowing and reaping. And in the worst case scenario, we could come under a false understanding and practice of this universal law. And there's plenty of evidence abound around us in our current Christian culture of the misuse and abuse of the biblical principle of sowing and reaping before us today. And sadly, in the end, these things often result in division, disillusion, and spiritual harm spiritual abuse. So with this in mind, starting at verse 6, Paul, in the authority given to him as an apostle of Christ, instructs the Galatian churches, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Verse 6. Here's an example where we can take something out of context if we are not careful. If we were to isolate this text, we will most likely misunderstand Paul's instruction and misapply it. Because you see, verse 6 is to be understood in the light of verse 2, where we read, bear one, another burden, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And another way we can understand verse 6 is with Paul's statement in chapter 5, verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another, which is then... Uh, obeying the command that we find in chapter 5, verse 14, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Thus, fulfilling the law of Christ. So what exactly is Paul getting at here in verse 6? Well, we can go to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians for some commentary. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, was dealing with some major issues, to say the least, in the church at Corinth. And one of them was certainly a challenge to his apostleship, just like, just like he was challenged in the churches in Galatia. And Paul reminds the Corinthian church, if we have so, sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. And in Paul's letter to Timothy, who was the pastor of the Ephesian church, Paul instructs Timothy like this. He said to Timothy, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. You find that in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. And John Stott, in his commentary on this text, puts it this way. Those who, quote, sow the good seed of God's word reap a livelihood. Now, I don't, want to be, I don't want to spend too much time here, folks. But in regard to those whom God calls to be pastors and teachers, leaders, the spiritual leaders of our local congregation, the Apostle Paul instructs the church to share all good things with the one who teaches. Now, we move to verse 7 and 8. And here we find Paul continuing what he's done throughout the whole letter using contrasts to make his points. We have seen this before, obviously. The crux of, the letter for, the crux of his letter, for example, is the contracts, contrast Paul portrayed between all who rely on the works of the law and the righteous who live by faith. We find that in chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. We've also seen the contrast between the son of the slave born according to the flesh and the son born through the promise in chapter 4, verse 23. The first representing the works of the law and the second, the righteous who live by faith. Moving into chapter 5, there's a contrast between the desires of the flesh, which are 
against the spirit and the desires of the spirit which are against the flesh. You find that in chapter 5, verse 17. And Paul, like any of, the contempor of his contemporary writers of his day, and even those in our day, using contrast as a literary device to highlight his points of teaching and instructions to the churches in Galatia. So when we look at verse 7 and 8, we find more contrasts. And let's read those verses together. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, this will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh, will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit, will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So let's begin with verse 7. And please notice with me the phrase, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. The verb translated deceived in the ESV, which is the translation I'm using, is best understood in the sense of deceiving oneself, deceiving oneself. We can see this also in Paul's letter uh, to the, the Corinthians in chapter 15, where he said, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 33 and 34. Secondly, the word deceived is in the imperative mood, thus making the clause, do not be deceived, a command to the Galatians. And then next we see Paul follows the commands with this statement, God is not mocked. And please notice with me the word mocked. And the root of this Greek word means to turn up the nose, to sneer at. We shouldn't understand that, this though, that this phrase means people ne never mock God. Yes, they do. What we have here though is something a little deeper. There's another contrast. And it's the difference between God, you and me, between God and people. Because we might turn our backs on God, we might slander God, we even deny his existence, cast our anger to God for our troubles, we might rep misrepresent God. All this and more, imagining that we're the masters of our own destinies, that we're in control of our own lives, we're the captains of our own ship. But the Bible tells us here that God will not be mocked. As one commentator uh, put it so well, quote, it's impossible to impose upon God who discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Moving along, Stott, John Stott in his commentary uh, in Galatians chapter 6 provides a lens in our approach to understanding the law of sowing and reaping. And as we unpack our text, we keep in mind that God is the one who puts certain laws into effect. For example, in creation, that is in the natural sphere, there are laws that govern all of nature. For example, the law of gravity. Because there's nowhere you can go, say, stand on a table or stand on a mountaintop and jump off and not fall. The law of gravity. Then how about the law of motion? That states for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. And so forth and so on. God has instituted laws that govern all nature. And God is the one who put the law of sowing and reaping into effect. And we can see this often worked out in agriculture, which is a great metaphor in this context. But I want us to get down to the nitty gritty of the sowing and reaping in the spiritual sphere, which has implications for each of us in the natural sphere as well. For we read in verse 7, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. So before us here, we have two kinds of sowing and two kinds of harvest. Paul said in verse 8, for the one who sows to his own flesh. This is the first kind of sowing that Paul mentions here, sowing to the flesh. Now I hope you remember what we discussed about the flesh, the meaning of this in the biblical text. We've already defined flesh not as body and blood, but our humanity or our human nature. 
Stott calls this the lower nature. Paul calls this in 524, chapter 5, verse 24, the flesh with its passions and desires. And we need to keep in mind that until Christ returns, our lower nature remains in us, with us, even after our conversion. And to use the agriculture metaphor, this is one of the fields that we can sow seeds. The field of the flesh, if you will. But there's a question. What are these seeds that we can sow? Well, friends, they are our thoughts, our words, and our actions. And for the one who sows his own flesh, willingly and purposely, it will be made manifest in their lives, or as Paul put it, now the works of the flesh are evident in chapter 5, verse 19. And then he gives a list there, uh, maybe nine, but there's more, obviously, of the working out of these, uh, the flesh. And this brings me to ask you, how's the planting going in your life? What seeds are you sowing and what field are you sowing into? For Paul goes on and speaks of another kind of sowing. But the one who sows to the Spirit. And when we look at this, as we look at all the texts here, we take this text in light of all that Paul had already set up to here. So when you and I sow to the Spirit, it's the same thing. It's the same as setting our mind on the things of the Spirit. Paul would put it this way to the church in Rome when he wrote in Romans 8, 6. He said, set the mind on the Spirit. And then one will reap life and peace. Again, we ask, what are these seeds? Well, these seeds, these seeds that we sow to the Spirit, they're our thoughts, our words, and our deeds, our actions. To Colossian Church, Paul said this, If you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Where Christ is. Set your minds on things above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Now back here in Galatians, verse 8. The one who sows to the Spirit is one who daily, as best as one can, walks by the Spirit, chapter 5, verse 16. And when we walk by the Spirit, we will not gratify the desires of our flesh. Same verse, same chapter. So we have two kinds of sowing. One to the flesh and one to the Spirit. And we have two kinds of harvest. So when one sows to their flesh, the text tells, tells us they will reap corruption. Verse 8. In the context here, corruption then is antithetical to the one who sows to the Spirit, and from the Spirit will reap eternal life. My friends, corruption is opposed to eternal life. And we need to remember the bigger picture here. We see this in the Old Testament. We see this throughout the Old Testament. We see this throughout the New Testament. We need to remember that God commands us to be holy as he's holy. Matter of fact, this is God's command for all people at all time in every place. But why don't we do this for a second? Let's press pause. Press pause. Because there's an elephant walking around in the digital room. Have you ever heard someone say that they believe that if they do enough good things, it will negate the bad things they have done? Have you ever heard someone say that to you or you discussed that with someone? Some might call this karma. Friends, Paul was not teaching any such thing. I will say any such nonsense. Paul was not spending any time in some hypothetical principle, some fairyland. No, when we sow to our flesh, we will reap corruption. Friends, this is the process of moral decay that the Bible is describing here. When we raise our hands high in the face of God and His law and say, Mind your own business, speak to the hand, get out of the way, you can't touch this. Moral decay. And we see this even in our own families, our communities, our countries. When God is ignored and mocked, things only go from bad to worse. And if not repented of, leads to only one place, death. 
But the one, my friends, who sows to the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Again, the spiritual law is made manifest in our lives through our thoughts, words, and deeds. It, this is the process that will lead to our moral and spiritual growth and benefit, not only to ourselves, but to others. The believer who is living in communion with God is already living an eternal life. And one day it will be perfected when Jesus returns. So to summarize, two kinds of sowing, to the flesh or to the spirit. Two kinds of harvest with two kinds of consequences. Corruption, which leads to death, or holiness, which leads to eternal life. Well, now moving into verse 9 and 10, please notice with me the, Paul's use of the plural pro pronouns, us and we. The spiritual principles and commands that we have here are not only for the individual. When the Holy Spirit in each believer has completed the spiritual work that is meant to be done, it is made and designed to be made manifest in service to one another. Hence the command of God, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Notice also here in verse 9 and 10 that Paul realized that serving Christ and others can be tiring work, can be hard work, can be spiritually hard, mentally, and physically, all three maybe at the same time. Well, the writer of Hebrews, my friends, understood this as his readers were under tremendous pressure from their culture in those days, from family and others for their faith in Christ. When the writer to the Hebrews said this, Consider him, that is Christ, who endured for, from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. When we consider our current cultural context, the state of the church in the West, the political and cultural pressures growing increasingly hostile to Christians, we can be tempted to give up. Tempted to be silent in the face of increasing moral decay in all spheres of our culture, and sadly the church included. We can be discouraged, we can surrender to all of this, let alone the day-to-day -day pressures of simply living out our lives. So I say, if you are there, God understands. He knows how you feel. He has been rejected, condemned, and hated. Remember, Jesus said, shed tears on a donkey while riding to Jerusalem during Holy Week, while every, you know, everyone around him were cheering. He cried from the Roman cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. My friends, be encouraged by the Apostle Paul, who knew all too well the price to be paid for following Christ when he said this, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are the household of faith. So here's the point. When we are doing good in the name of Christ, when we persevere, Having, the ministry, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, 2 Corinthians 4.1. When we wake up in the morning, commit our day to God, and walk as best as we know how by uh, the Holy Spirit, we walk in the Spirit, we will, you can take this to the bank, my friends, we will in due time reap a harvest. What kind of harvest? Well, possibilities abound. Opportunities, my friends, are everywhere. So as I bring this to a conclusion, I want to uh, uh, read to you the account of one Char Charles Simeon, who lived a long time ago, and uh, his struggles. So when he was appointed as the pastor of a church in Cambridge, England, in 1783, Charles Simeon was delighted. The people of the church did not share his joy. Many of the prominent members of the church opposed his convictions on reaching the lost with the gospel. And to show, the dis to show their displeasure, they locked their pew boxes during the service and left them empty so that those who came to hear Simeon preach had to stand or sit in the aisles. Eventually, God began to work, and Simeon's ministry had a powerful influence on the nation of England and the world through his efforts to encourage missionary work. And during the dark days of opposition, Simeon wrote this. 
In this state of things, I saw no remedy but faith and patience. It was painful indeed to see the church, with the exception of the isles, almost forsaken. But I thought that if God would only give a double blessing to the congregation that did attend, there would be on the whole be as much good done as if the congregation were doubled and the blessing, blessing limited to only half the amount. This comforted me many, many times when without such a reflection, I should have sunk under my burden. Opposition does not mean that we're doing things wrong. Often it is evidence that we're doing things right. If we allow ourselves to be deterred from doing anything unless we have complete approval, it is certain that we'll never accomplish anything of value. Rather than being discouraged by opposition, we should take comfort in God's faithfulness and keep on doing what is right. Let us pray together. Our Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much for this message. And I pray for those who are hearing this, wherever they are, if they are discouraged and down in their hearts, as they look around, maybe in their families and their communities and the world around us. Oh, Father, I pray, God, that you would lift them up. For your Bible teaches us and shows us that when we are low, you can lift us up. That when, are, when we are weak, you are strong. So I pray for that, for each and every one that hears this. And thank you, Lord, for your kindness and your love and your mercy in our lives. I pray that you will be honored and blessed with our lives, in and through our lives, as we reach others for Christ. And may we do so with the boldness and the courage that you give us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Blessed it be the name of the Lord God forever and ever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, my friends. God's blessings on you. Shalom.